So with, with, with further ado, I want to present Ben. He's actually on, on board right now with us, Ben Diedrich. He's actually a, a, a lawyer, a, a, a local lawyer and, and a very friend uh, to, the, to the credit union, to us, uh, of the community, the chamber communities and everything. And Ben Diedrich will actually be making the presentation with us today. Ben, can you unmute yourself? Good. Yes, sir. I'm good to go now. Thank you so much, Caesar. All right, thanks, Ben. So yeah, so thank you everybody for coming tonight on this Wednesday evening. I know there are more fun places you might wanna be, but I hope that tonight will be educational for you and hopefully maybe some entertainment as well. Um, you know, typically we do this in person in one of Front Wave's conference rooms or something like that. So what Caesar was talking about, you know, normally the way I like to do it rather than it just be being so dry and a one-way conversation, from me, I usually like to have it where as a topic comes up where you may have a question that you chime in and you ask a question that's a little bit more difficult through these webinars to do it that way. So again, like Caesar mentioned, if you have a question as it's going on, please type it into the chat box. Um, we will either get to it at the end or if Caesar sees something that makes sense to come to a stop and discuss that question, maybe he'll bring it up for my attention as we're going through. Uh, another thing I found out by not doing it in person, but through these webinars is, you know, people prefer it to be more direct to the point, get through it, get the information, get to our questions and move on with our day. So I'll try to be, you know, as, as to the point and educational and informative as I can be um, while being understanding of your time and getting through this in a in a in all due course. So tonight we're going to talk about what you need to know when planning for your family's future, um, how to ensure you can leave them with a lifetime of protection, guidance, and love for everybody that you care about. So as we go on, let's get going. I'm assuming you can see my screen still, Caesar. Yes, we can. All right. So who am I? Why are, why are you listening to me? <laughs> what am I doing here, right? So as Caesar mentioned, I'm an attorney. Uh, my background is actually, I have a degree in molecular biology. I went to law school and became a patent attorney, uh, worked with inventors, corporations, protecting their inventions, did that for over a decade. And <clears throat> you know, my family and I wanted to move back to the Inland Empire. I started my career out in Orange County. We wanted to move back to the Inland Empire. I moved back, started my own firm, and while we still do a good amount of patent work, intellectual property work, when, we, when I created my firm, I wanted to do estate planning. We, had, we started our own family. Uh, we've lost some parents and grandparents and saw the importance of it, the need for it, and I wanted to really do something where I could work a lot more with the local community, not just with the corporations I work with on the patent side. So that's why we got into the estate planning side of things. What are we going to learn today? We're going to talk about why the typical estate plan might fail. And by failing, what I mean is leaving your family in court and in conflict. Uh, we're going to talk about how to know if your family's at risk and if they are, what we can do about it. So why did you come today, maybe? There's you know, multiple reasons people give me for why they wanted to look into estate planning. Either they want to ensure that your family's taken care of as you age and once you're gone. Another reason is you want to learn how to grow your assets and then have peace of mind that it'll be handled properly um, when something happens to you. Some people want to know how to avoid unnecessary taxes. Uh, another thing some people are concerned about as we age is making sure that we are actually taken care of and that the best decisions are made for us if we become incapacitated. We're going to be talking about all of those things tonight. So if any of those reasons clicked for you, you made the right choice by being here tonight. So let's talk about some estate planning basics. So basically every adult needs to do at least some basic estate planning to keep their family out of court and out of conflict. In California, most families likely need trust-based planning by creating a revocable living trust, more than just the basics of a will, healthcare directive and financial power of attorney, right? So in California, if you have assets, that total over what's now 166,000. For years and years, it was $150,000 even, and it was a nice easy number. Now they changed it last year to $166,250. So if you have total assets totaling more than that figure and they are not in a trust, your family's gonna end up going through probate. 
So the best way to avoid that and why I say most people in California need a living trust, right, is that lump, that number 166, 250 is fairly low, right? And we know what real estate in California is like. So almost everybody who owns a home in California is going to already automatically be above that $166,000 level, right? Because it's the value of your home that puts you in there. It's not how much equity you may or may not have in it. You may have negative equity in your house, but it's still worth more than 166,000 and therefore will end up in probate. So the best way to avoid putting your family through that is with a properly funded and updated revocable living trust and having an ongoing relationship with legal counsel um, over time, right? Not just doing something where you created a trust 20 years ago, put it on a shelf, it got dusty and you've never looked at it again. Um, that's a potential avenue for problems there. So let's talk about the next steps of estate planning. If you have minor or permanently dependent children, you need to do more than basic planning. You need a rock solid plan to protect your kids. Um, Another thing that people come in all the time thinking it does, which it doesn't do, a revocable living trust does not protect your assets. There are strategies that can be done. You know, very wealthy people do things like create offshore accounts and move their funds there to try to protect their assets. If you were to get sued or something like that, a revocable living trust does not protect your assets in that type of situation. Um, estate taxes, they can be avoided too, but if you have, to, if you put in the work, you need to have your foundational plan in place first. Again, most people, most all people I work with um, right now don't have to worry about estate taxes. So the way the estate tax minimum is set right now, um, thanks to the outgoing president that just left today, was that it's 11 million per individual. So if you're a married couple, it's $22 million in your estate before estate taxes kick into play. So the people I work with typically don't have over $22 million in assets. So right now, we're not worried about dealing with estate taxes. But during our lifetimes, it's been as low as you know a few hundred thousand dollars is where estate taxes kicked in. Um, so th at that point, we are worried potentially about leaving the state tax issues to our children. So we wanna be flexible. And that's why one of the things I just mentioned about not just creating a trust, letting it sit on the shelf for 20, 30 years and never looking at it again. Um, you know, If that estate tax minimum drops from where it is right now, the 11 or 22 million and comes back down to a much lower number in the future, then maybe we wanna address and look at that in our estate plan and update our estate plan to take that into consideration. So is your family at risk? If you don't have any plan in place, or if it's been more than say three years or so since you've last updated, your family might be at risk. If you don't have a plan in place, your family will end up in court um, and potentially in conflict, which, you know, probate court, I don't know if anybody's dealt, anybody online has dealt with that with a family member, um, but it's expensive, it's time consuming and it's totally public, right? And there's a good chance that assets will end up getting lost in that process. Um, that can be because you haven't properly titled the assets, you haven't properly tracked them, or you know, if you do have a plan, it hasn't been kept up to date. So that's something we want to look at. Another reason your family might be at risk is if you don't have coordinated planning between the generations. So I'm going to keep talking about this today, but assets can easily be lost if there isn't coordination between the generations. So what I'm talking about here is that, you know, the typical trust typically leaves the assets outright to your children at a specific age, um, or sometimes it'll be, you know, at three stages, maybe 25, 30, and 35 or something like that. Um, but typically under these normal plans, the assets are immediately handed out to your children. They put them into their bank account, and then they're immediately at risk. When I say at risk, uh, they can be lost if they end up getting divorced or to taxes or to creditors or in a lawsuit. If they're driving down the freeway and get into a car accident and they get sued, they can lose those assets that way. You know, these risks can be avoided for your children with proper planning. And so we want to look at that. And even worse, if you don't do any planning, the money is automatically going to be handed outright immediately to your adult children. Or if your children are minors, it'll go, they'll get a guardian until they're 18, and then it'll go to them right at the day they turn 18, assuming there's any money left after the guardian has dealt with it. 
Another reason your family might be at risk is if you don't have a family wealth inventory. Family wealth inventory is what we call our uh, an asset spreadsheet we create for our clients where it lists all of your assets. So we work with our clients to create a proper and full inventory of their assets to make sure that nothing ends up getting lost to the state, the California State Unclaimed Property Department. We then continue to work with you on an ongoing basis to make sure that spreadsheet or what we call our family wealth inventory is updated over your lifetime. So right now, you know, there's over 9 billion billion with a B, $9 billion worth of assets sitting in California's unclaimed property department. And that's just from assets that when someone passes, um, their family members aren't aware of a life insurance policy or a retirement account or a bank account that wasn't you know, their main bank or something like that. And so it just sits there. The state holds onto it for a period of years waiting for somebody to come up and claim it. So we want to make sure the assets you work so hard to create don't get lost like that. Another way your family could be at risk is if you don't have an ongoing relationship with an attorney, with counsel. If you don't have an ongoing relationship with a lawyer, you know, your family's at risk of being sucked into court, even if you did do some planning, right? So that's why we think every few years, you should have your plan reviewed to make sure that it still makes sense for you, still makes for your family and your family's needs. So what are some reasons why estate plans may fail? So estate plans can fail if the assets aren't documented or owned properly. So most people don't properly document their assets or don't title them properly. This can lead to the loss of those assets going to that state unclaimed property department that I was talking about earlier. We wanna make sure that doesn't happen. Another reason estate plans can fail is if they're not kept up to date. I'm going to keep hammering on about this, but it's something you want to keep looking at. You know, laws change every year. We talked about the estate tax changes. We talked about the probate minimum laws changing. Um, you know, in the 10, 15 years ago, most trusts that were created for married couples were what were called AB trusts. And that was to allow the assets upon the first spouse's death to be transferred to the second spouse without it being penalized to the second spouse. Um, the laws have changed since then. There's what's called portability now where they can just transfer without that. And so that AB trust oftentimes is actually more of a headache than it needs to be. And so, you know, we get tons of people coming in with trust reviews now where they still have old AB trusts and we wanna get rid of that. So these are, you know, just examples of why you wanna make sure you take a look at your trust every few years to make sure it still makes sense for you. Another reason estate plans can fail is if your family hasn't been um, adequately informed about the plan before you die or, or are incapacitated. You know, it's all too often that families aren't aware that any planning has been done or if it has what it consists of. So we wanna make sure they're aware of that before something happens to you so that everybody's on the same page. So we don't want your plan to fail. So. We, we wanna make sure you take steps to ensure that none of these common pitfalls occur, so, right? So if when we work with our clients, we bring everybody back free of charge at least every three years to review their plan and make sure it still works for them. For people that have more ongoing needs, we have membership programs that are for those people that have more ongoing needs than that. We, you know, we create and help you track that family wealth inventory spreadsheet of all of your assets to make sure that nothing gets lost. So, you know, what's the typical experience? The typical estate planning experience, I call it planning for death in that case, right? So the common situation, uh, if you work with legal, Zoom, or some other online providers, or even some local attorneys, you know, oftentimes it's just a one-time transaction. You walk out with form documents at the end of that meeting. You never talk to them again. You hope that everything is good, everything makes sense, and everything is going to continue working for you. In that case, you fa your family may end up avoiding probate. They may avoid paying estate taxes, um, but typically the assets are gonna be left to your heirs unprotected. You're not gonna have ongoing legal guidance as the laws change, as your family situation changes. And without you know, actually documenting those assets, retitling those assets into the trust, you know, you're potentially gonna lose some of those assets to that unclaimed property department. So that's we think it's a less than ideal experience. So what we think is a better experience is planning for life rather than planning for death. 
We want you to make informed, empowered decisions that are your decisions after you've been educated and know what makes sense for you and your family. We want to make sure that your family saves thousands of dollars by planning for you know, the future. We want to prevent the loss of those assets at your death. We want to protect family money from outsiders. Again, probate's a totally public open forum, um, which is a scary thing oftentimes. We want to keep your family out of court and out of conflict. And we want you to have a lifetime of financial and legal um, education and decisions that you're making. And then there's the worst experience, right? So if you do no planning whatsoever, California has a plan for you, right? And this, <laughs> more often than not, this is the worst way to go about it, right? So if you were to become incapacitated or die without a plan in place, whether that's a will or a trust or whatever makes sense in your situation, um, then your family will end up in, pro in probate court. It's called a conservatorship if you're incapacitated, it's called probate if you die. In either case, the judge is gonna make the decisions for you. It may be what you would have chosen and it may not be. So, you know, if we can save money and have the decisions already made beforehand, it only makes sense to do that. So California's plan, going through probate, it's a very expensive process, right? We have, there's a laundry list of things here that get paid when you go through the probate process attorney's fees, executor's fees, appraiser's fees, 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 right? Um, bond premiums, et cetera. So we estimate that a typical probate ends up costing your family about 5% of the fair market value of your assets. And that's the key language there, the far, fair market value of your assets. So it's not what they're actually worth to you or, or your heirs, right? So if you own a $500,000 home, but you have a $450,000 mortgage on it, there's only $50,000 in equity there that your kids would actually get if you left it to them. But that 5% surcharge of going through probate is gonna be on that total value of 500,000, not the $50,000 in equity that you may have. So it can get very expensive very quickly. Another big problem with it is it's time consuming. It's, you know, in California, the fastest you're going to get, and this is before COVID, where now the courts are incredibly backed up now at this point. But even before COVID, you know, on a best case scenario where there weren't any issues or disputes involved, it takes 12 to 18 months to get through probate. That's a long time for your family to be waiting and having to deal with that as they're also grieving your loss, right? Uh, I've talked about this before, but it's also totally public, right? It's public records. So people can see who's getting what, how much they're getting and when they're getting it, which is another thing we typically wanna avoid, especially if your heirs are gonna be young. Um, and then the assets are distributed outright and unprotected, right? This is what we call the worst experience. So for people that here that have kids, this is typically where I'd ask people to raise their hands and let me know who has minor children in the room to see whether this makes sense, but we're gonna talk about it briefly at least. So if you have minor children, you know the vast majority of parents haven't named guardians for their kids if something were to happen to them. And in that case, if something does happen to you, the judge is gonna be the one who decides who raises your kids. Um, you know, This can be a nightmare if you have family members fighting over or disagreeing as to who should raise your kids. If you have two different grandparents fighting over it or a sibling and a grandparent or whatever, it's, it can be a nightmare. And in which case a conservator is appoint, appointed. The conservator oversees the funds you leave to your kids until they turn 18. And they, you know, they can actually drain the resources before your kids receive their inheritance. Um, it's not something we like to see. So it's a very easy thing to do to name guardians for your kids. So let's, you know, at the very minimum, let's get that in place so that if something happens to you, it's not the court deciding who's gonna raise your kids. Another thing to think about is even if you name guardians in a will, there can still be issues that a lot of people don't think about. A lot of people, a lot of attorneys don't think about. You know, if you're the people you want to be the guardians for your kids live out of the area, you need to do more than standard planning, right? So if you're the people you're naming for guardians of your kids are, you know, your brother and sister-in-law that live in New York, right? They're not going to be local if something happens to you. Um, and so we want to make sure your kids aren't taken in by CPS until the guardians can get there, right? So we wanna do more advanced planning than just your long-term guardians being named. 
Another thing you need to be aware of if this applies to you and it doesn't apply to everybody, doesn't apply to most people, but for the people that it does apply to, we wanna make sure we take care of it. If you have family members that you know should not be raising your children, you need to do more than standard planning to make sure that that doesn't happen. You know, at this point we talk about common planning techniques that don't work. This is what people say, well, can I just do this as, right? So owning properly jointly, this, I get this a lot from people where, well, can't I just put my kids on title to my house so that it won't go through probate and not do any other planning, something like that, right? So let's talk about owning property jointly, first between spouses and then doing it with non-spouses. So if you own property jointly with your spouse as joint tenants, then it does prevent probate at the first death. The joint tenancy just lets it pass right to the survivor on the deed without having to go through probate. Um, but in that case, between spouses, by having it held as joint tenancy, you lose the benefit of erasing the tax gain on the property upon their death, right? So I can't tell you how many married couples come into us where they own their deed, they're married and they own their deed as joint tenants. Community property, we're in California, community property state, if you own it as community property, that allows that tax gain to be erased upon the first death, which is can be a huge value. And so by holding this joint tenancy rather than community property, you're losing that value. And so, you know, I don't know why so many couples own their, their homes as joint tenancy rather than community property. I can only assume that when they're going through their paperwork buying the house, you know, joint tenancy is the first checkbox there and they're not really explained what the differences are. And that's why so many people come in as joint tenancy, but we wanna get it as community property so that that tax gain can be erased upon the first death. Joint tenancy with non-spouses opens up a huge can of worms of losing the asset due to the other person's creditors, right? So if you put your kids, your adult kids onto the title to your house or as another signer on your bank account or something like that, those assets, are legally and technically their assets as well. So if they get into a financial issue, whether it's a credit problem, bankruptcy, a lawsuit because they hit someone in their car or something like that, those assets can be taken from you. Your house can be taken from you. Your bank account can be taken from you because they're listed on there as joint tenancy. So there's better ways to do it than just by putting them on as on the title of the assets. Another common planning technique that doesn't always work is designating the beneficiary. So people will say, okay, well, rather than putting them on the bank account as a co-signer, I'll put them on as a payable on death, right? Or with life insurance, they'll be the beneficiary. And so that's, that's great when it works, right? The, it's better than nothing, that's for sure. But many assets that we might have don't allow for designating a beneficiary. So what do we do then, right? Another issue is that the beneficiary, once they receive it, they have unlimited control over the assets. And if you name a minor, if you have minor children that you're naming as a beneficiary, whether it's of life insurance or a bank account or whatever, now you're guaranteeing that they're going to probate because minors can't take that property directly. Another reason, another problem with designating beneficiaries is if you ever decide to change the beneficiaries, you have to do it with each institution, with each account changing it. Whereas if you just have the trust being the owner of those assets and you want to change who the beneficiaries, you just make a change in your trust rather than having to go to each account and make that change. Another thing I hear all too often is I signed a will, right? I have a will in place. That's going to keep my family out of probate, right? It's actually the opposite, right? So estate planners, we have a saying where there's a will, there's a probate, right? So a will is a document to be used in probate court. That's the whole purpose of it, right? So creating a will is not gonna keep your family out of probate. Wow. It's gonna guarantee they go to probate. So, um, and maybe in your situation, you're not gonna end up in probate or it makes sense. There are situations where just having a will makes sense, but I hate when I hear people say, oh, I, my family's not gonna go to probate. I have a will in place when it's the exact opposite of that. Caesar, I saw you jump in. Do we have questions or anything, or should I keep yeah, plugging yeah, we along? Have a few questions that we wanted to ask you, Ben. Uh, one of the first ones actually is in regards to uh, taxes. So the question is, does the taxes kick in at 11 million, 
only for revocable trust or is it at the or is it at the case with only a will too so the estate tax the federal estate tax for 11 million for an individual or in which case it would be 22 million for a married couple that that comes into play for when your estate is over that amount regardless of whether it's you hold it outright or you have a will in place or you have them funded to a trust it's what it, it's when you die whatever assets you have in place okay does that make is that clear does that make sense yes it makes sense yeah uh, I have another question. Uh, it's uh, it's a question in regards to properties as to, as to where they, they have the properties. It says, I own a home in Oceanside and a condo in Hawaii. Last year, I moved to Hawaii and my grown son is living in the home in California. Can I have an attorney create a revocable living trust in California for both properties? Also, I have a concern that my lender will try to pull a due on sale after I die. They are saying I have to live in the Oceanside home to put the to put the trust as the deed holder, or they can do that. Also, are they saying the trust has to follow the procedures in the Office of Thrift Superb Regulations? How do I avoid this without having to move back to California home? Does so yeah, let's let's talk yeah. about. It. There's quite a few things there, so <laughs> let's yeah, break sorry. that down a little bit. <laughs> so yes, if you own properties in multiple states you are the prime candidate for wanting a trust, right? Because the property has to be probated in the state of its location, right? So if you have a property in California and a property in Hawaii, and you don't have a trust in place, now you have yeah. not just a probate, you have a probate and a probate in California that you have to deal with, right? So it can get really problematic at that point. So multiple properties in multiple states, you are the prime candidate for having a trust to avoid those issues. Um, I know there were some more issues about ownership, right? So there's a federal law in place that uh, a due on transfer clause, right? Where they can call your loan due because you transferred title to it. There's a federal law that says if you're transferring your residence into your own revocable living trust, they cannot trigger that due on sale clause, right? That's only applies to your personal residence. If you have rental properties or things like that, that federal law is not in place. So if you have a mortgage on properties that are not your residence, it can be more difficult, right? So typically what we need to do is we get permission from the lender who can trust because it's still not who's like I said, it doesn't protect your assets. So in the trust, in the fact that you lie a mortgage. So typically what we can do, we can get permission from the lender before we move it into the trust so that they won't, if they refuse to give that authorization, you can either refinance it or we can do some other techniques to try to get you some protection, get it into the trust without triggering that due on sale clause. Okay, thank you, Ben. I have one more question that I wanted to ask you uh, and one of the attendees, they're from out of, out of state in Texas and they wanted to know if there's different rules uh, that applies to a different state. So yeah, so you know, probate is different from state to state. So each state has different probate. So when I'm talking about that small estate limit of $166,250, that's California's law. Each state has their own different law for what that might look like. So yes, if you're if your residence, if your state of residence is Texas, then you would need to work with a Texas attorney to do your estate planning. That said, a trust you create is valid in all 50 states, right? So if you work with, a, if you're a California resident, for example, and you work with a California attorney to create your trust, move your assets into your trust, and then you end up retiring to Texas or Arizona or Nevada or Florida or wherever, your trust is still gonna be valid and still going to work in that state that you move to. You don't need to create a new trust just because you move to a new state. Okay, great. Thank you, Ben. Those are all the questions for now, Ben. Thank you. All right, great. So another planning technique that doesn't always work is relying on a trust schedule, right? So a lot of times people will create their trust, they'll list their assets on a trust schedule, 
they'll attach it to the trust and then that's it. They won't actually retitle the assets. They won't actually move the assets in, into the trust and fund their trust. The problem with that is you didn't retitle them into the trust. So you're gonna have to petition the court to look at that trust schedule and say, these assets should actually be a part of the trust. Court, please make them assets of the trust and don't make us go through the whole probate process. So you're still ending up going to court. If it works, if that petition works, then you avoid the full probate, but you still had to hire an attorney, go make that argument and hope that it works. You know, recently as years have been going on, the courts have been coming stricter and stricter as to whether they will actually accept these trust schedule assets as being in the trust. So, you know, we still create trust schedules for our clients, but we create it as an emergency backup. Our main goal is still to get those actual assets into the trust. And I know it takes some work and that's why it doesn't always happen, but that is the goal. That's gonna be the safest route for your family. Speaking of that, right? The only foolproof way to avoid court is to have a fully funded living trust with disability provisions, right? So fully funded, I mean, moving all of your assets into the trust. So they're held by the trust and not by you individually anymore. And then making sure that your trust has good disability provisions so that it applies, you know, a will only applies after you die, right? It has no legal force until you die. A trust can have disability provisions and come into play when you're disabled. So this allows, you know, your successor trustee, whether that's a child that you pick or somebody else that you pick, somebody that you trust can actually step in while you're disabled, especially, you know, even if it's only a temporary disability, they can step in handle your finances, your situation for you, and then you get control back once you're no longer disabled. So, you know, that's the best way, the foolproof way to avoid court. You know, this, the trust should be customized for you and your family, not just a boilerplate trust that hopefully works for you. And it's, you know, it's the same one they've given out to a hundred different people, and hopefully it's going to work for you and your family. And all those assets should be retitled into the trust. If you already have a trust, chances are it hasn't been updated, right? More often than not, the people I see have never updated their trust. So it's likely out of date, either because, you know, your life changes, the laws change, your assets change. That's why we want to make sure that you keep looking at your trust as time goes on to make sure it still makes sense for you and your family. I talked about this before, and it's true. Um, this is, you know, the hardest part of creating the trust, other than maybe writing your attorney a check, is retitling the assets into the trust. So it can take some time and effort to make that happen, but don't worry, right? If you work with us, we either guide you step-by-step step how to do it or we do it for you. And luckily you guys bank with Front Wave Credit Union, they make it easy on their side with their, with their bank accounts, right? So Front Wave Credit Union, they actually will let you retitle your accounts into the name of the trust. You know, other large, national bank conglomerates, right? I won't name names, but they're <laughs> larger banks that you know that are on every corner, right? Oftentimes they won't let you retitle your accounts into the trust. They'll make you actually close the account down and open a new account in the trust name. And you'll have to transfer the assets over there, transfer any direct deposits or auto pays that you have out of it. And so it can be even more work in that case. Front Wave at least makes that easier for you guys to do. So we wanna make sure you don't lose your assets that you work so hard for, right? I talked about earlier that there's currently over $9 billion in California's Department of Unclaimed Property. Most of it got there because someone died and the family just didn't know about that account. We don't want you to contribute further to that account, right? So we wanna help make sure you get your life financially organized, ensure your family knows what you have and make sure it isn't lost. A secret bonus of doing planning in advance, right, is, you know, do you want to make sure that your children don't lose their inheritance to a future spouse in a divorce, right, or to creditors or to a lawsuit? Um, by creating a trust, you get to control how those assets are distributed, unlike with a will or probate, you get to control how those assets are distributed. So not just when your kids turn 18. You know, most trusts, the way a standard trust is written is they give the assets typically out on a schedule, right? So for example, they'll give a third at age 25, a third at age 30, and, a, and the last third at age 35. That works, but there can be smarter ways about doing it, right? So 
you know, I have plenty of people that come to me either because they're business owners or even that aren't, they want to figure out how can they protect their assets, right? If I put my assets into a revocable living trust, will that protect them if I get sued? And the answer is no. And it's really, really hard to give ourselves that kind of protection for our own assets, but you can leave them to your kids by doing, you know, this kind of planning with your trust. You can leave them to their kids in a way that can't be touched by creditors that will never be subject to estate taxes, regardless of what the estate tax limit is um, and won't be taken away in the event of a divorce, right? So we'd love to do that for ourselves. We can't, but we can leave it to our kids that way. You know, it's a rock solid form of asset protection that actually works, unlike creating offshore accounts that may or may not work. Um, added bonus, it's easy to do and it doesn't cost a lot, but most attorneys don't think about doing this kind of level of planning, right? So. If you want to leave them to your kids this way, it's a cutting edge technique that you can do. Um, and it just takes a couple extra steps and you're good to go. And you can leave your kids, the, your assets in this protected fashion, which I think is pretty cool. You know, we talked a lot about leaving your financial assets to your heirs, right? Um, but what about your, your intellectual, spiritual and human assets, right? What about your stories, your wisdom, your advice? Um, I think those can be for many families just as important, if not more important than the financial assets they're leaving behind. And that's why we conduct a, a third meeting where we record these additional assets for your family once you're gone. We have what we call our family legacy conversations or family legacy interviews where we, we have a conversation and we record that for your family for when you're gone, that they can listen to your voice, hear your stories, hear your insights, the things you would want to tell them. Um, you know, my mother was killed in an accident in 2006. It was sudden out of the blue. She never recovered from that. And so I didn't have that, right? I had a, I had a last voicemail from her that I would listen to when I wanted to hear her voice again. And it was just, you know, give me a call when you have a chance or let's get together for dinner this weekend or something like that, right? It wasn't anything meaningful. And eventually, you know, as phones change, as we change providers, the voicemail was gone, right? So so I want to make sure that if they're, if that's important to you, that we can leave those assets behind to your family as well, not just your financial assets. So, you know, form focused planning for most people, it doesn't work, right? Whether that's a do it yourself online or with a cheap bargain bin lawyer or paralegal, oftentimes it leaves holes in your planning, right? We talk about these issues tonight, it, you know, doesn't keep your assets at court. They end up in probate anyways, or they end up going to the unclaimed property department. It doesn't protect your inheritance for future generations. Uh, it can leave your children at risk of who they're cared for if you have minor children. Um, and it only addresses the financial assets, not the human ones. So the way we work is we start all of our interactions, our relationships with our new clients with what we call our family legacy protector session. So it's a, it's a two hour working meeting that helps you get fully financially organized. Some people are already financially organized and it's quick and easy and painful. Some people are not financially organized. And even if they don't end up hiring us to do any work for them, now all of a sudden by preparing for this, they at least have their finances organized in order, which is, which is highly beneficial. These meetings allow you to make empowered choices, right? So you choose the right planning level for you, the right options for you, the right fees for you and your family. The way we work, all our fees are flat fees. They're agreed to in advance and there aren't any surprises, right? So we, we have three different levels of planning that we offer. They range from the low end for a very simple matter, about 1500 up to the more complicated, uh, lots of assets, lots of planning to do $7,500. They typically, most clients that we work with, especially for our clients, end up on the lower side of that range. Um, but again, this is gonna be a number that's drastically lower than what your family would end up paying if they ended up going through probate court. And ultimately that's who you're doing this planning for, right? You're gonna be gone. So this planning is really for your family. So what are the next steps, right? So for that family legacy protector session, normally we charge $750 for that session or $950 if we have an existing trust that we need to review. Uh, we do an exist uh, comprehensive review, 50 plus points that we, when we look at trusts that are already in place, that covers our initial two hour working session and 
moves us forward to the next step of actually designing and creating your plan. For members of FrontWave, we waive that fee. We don't charge that fee. So we do that family legacy protector session free of charge for FrontWave customers. Um, as an added bonus for FrontWave customers, we knock $250 off of any fees that we do end up quoting you to, to do work together. And right now with COVID as you know, I thought going into a year into this, we would have been long done with COVID at this point um, and that I wouldn't be offering this anymore, but here we are, right? So right now during COVID as the numbers keep getting worse and worse, um, I think it's critically important for everybody to at least have an advanced healthcare directive in place if they have to go into the hospital for whatever reason. So even if you don't wanna do any further estate planning with us, we're offering free advanced healthcare directives to front wave customers right now. So at least you have that, right? So those are the next steps, either to sign up for a family legacy protector session, um, which we waive the fees and give you $250 off any work you do for us, or at least contact us and get an advanced healthcare directive in place for you. And the way you can do that is on this slide. And, you know, I know, See some people have their cameras out to take pictures of that's probably the easiest way and maybe i can put it into the chat box as well um we have we have a link that you can use um, to schedule your family legacy protector session or you can call into our office talk with our client service director to schedule it and if you just want the advanced healthcare directive which is totally fine if that's what you want you can just send me an email um, at this address here and put in there the webinar free directive as a subject and we'll send you the form we need to get the information to create that advanced healthcare directive for you. So let me see if I can just type in those things in here. Maybe that'll be easier for you guys to copy and paste them if you want. But other than that, um, Caesar, do we have questions or? Uh, hello, Ben. Th thanks for your presentation. Uh, no, we don't have any other questions in the chat, but we can open it if you like to any questions that any of the attendees would like to, uh, you know, uh, uh, answer via via just conversation. You know, we could actually have them raise their hand or go below the chat and let us know if anybody has any questions. And we could go from there and answer any questions for them. Sounds good. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer questions for anybody who has any still at this point. Just want to open it up again if anybody has any more questions for Ben. Caesar, it looks like maybe some questions are coming into the chat. They are, yeah. Did you want to look through them, Ben, or do you want me to just direct them to you? How, yeah. What would be next? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let, let me let's let's try to answer those at least. So someone asked, said we're we yeah, are so you. Southern California homeowners. We have two adult children. We've done nothing to prepare. What do you suggest? Well, my short answer is I suggest you schedule a family legacy protector session, right? And we can figure out what the next best steps are for you. But really, if you own a home in California, you're, when something happens to you, you're, it's going to end up in probate, right? So probably, you know, the, the non-flip answer is you probably want to get a revocable living trust set up and move the house at least as well as your other assets into that living trust. Then another person asked, is my military pension taxable when my child inherits it? So pensions are going to be taxable typically as income to them. So if, if you're talking about an ongoing pension that they receive versus a lump sum, that changes it up a little bit. So we would need to know a little bit more of the details there to really answer that question. Um, and those are good questions for CPAs too, right? So, so I, you know, what I'm going to be what I, what we estate planners do does deal with the tax side of things really. But if you have tax issues from things like retirement accounts and like that, really it's going to be your CPA, your accountant, that's going to have the best answers for you in that situation. Uh, another person asked, if we set up a trust, is our child still liable for paying an inheritance tax? So the answer is if there's going to be an estate tax due, it doesn't necessarily matter whether you set up a revocable living trust or not, it's still going to be due if you don't take next level steps of protecting that from the estate tax somehow. That said, right now, we don't have to, for my clients, we don't have to do those extraordinary steps to protect them from the estate tax right now because of that 
limit where it kicks in. The estate tax doesn't kick in until 11 million for an individual or 22 million for a married couple. So, you know, until it drops back down potentially in the future to a lower limit, we're not really having to do that advanced level planning um, to protect our kids from the estate tax. Another person asked, I have, it looks like I have a home valued at 2 million, which is in joint tenancy. I also have a living trust. Does the living trust can cover the joint tenancy? So if the house is still titled as joint tenancy, if it hasn't been retitled into the name of the trust, then no, it is not covered by the trust. It may have been listed on uh, a, on an asset list, right, as a, uh, an asset schedule in your trust, maybe. And if that case, if it is on there, uh, you can petition the court to consider it to be as part of the trust, but it's still the judge's discretion to do so. And so the best way is to actually retitle it from joint tenancy into the trust. And if it is joint tenancy and you're a married couple, uh, I talked about a little bit earlier, we didn't go into too much detail on the community property versus joint tenancy and getting that step up in tax basis to erase the gain on the first spouse's death, right? So if you do, if you are a married couple and you own title as joint tenancy with which many, many, many of our clients do, that is the case, we actually convert it first from the joint tenancy into community property so that we get that benefit of that step up in tax basis when the first spouse dies. And then we take that community property deed and we put that into the trust. So that's the best case scenario. Another person asked, what or how do you put property in or out of a trust for buying and selling real property in California? So it's retitling the, the deed into the name of the trust, right? So moving it into the trust, you would retitle it from you as an individual into the trust's name. Taking it out of the trust, you would do the reverse of that. Another person asked, what's the difference between a trust and probate? And said, sorry, this is very confusing. It is very confusing. And I hope I didn't add to that confusion. I, I know that I may have, this is a complicated subject area. So I apologize if I did make it more confusing than it needs to be. Um, but probate is the legal proceeding that happens to your assets after you die, if they're not in a revocable living trust, right? So there it's how, if you have, if you own a home, any assets, but I'll use a home, for example, because that's the prime one that's going to put you into probate. If you own a home, not in a revocable living trust, but you own it as an individual or with your spouse, right? When you die, in order to take you off of the title, since you're no longer here to sign a deed taking you off the title, a judge has to come in and take you off the title. And that's the probate process. By moving the asset into a revocable living trust, you can avoid going through the probate process, avoid having a judge being involved, avoid having the court procedures and costs and time and expense, because now it's the trust that owns the asset. And so if when you pass, yes, you're no longer there, but now the successor trustee, whoever you named to come in and control the trust after something happens to you, they now can sign and take you off of that deed at that point or take the trust off the deed at that point. So it's a much simpler, easier process. Another person says, I have a will, but in need of a trust. Yes, okay. Um, another person said, I'm single, own a home, no mortgage, have two adult children and a minimal bank account. The children know they are to share. Would I still need a trust? So even though, so that's great that you have no mortgage. Congratulations on that. Um, but the house, assuming it's worth more than $166,000, which I would can only assume it is since it is in California, without having it in a trust, that, pro, the, that house, in order to be sold, will have to go through the probate process. So yes, you are likely in a good situation to still need a living trust in that case. Another person asked if the estate tax minimum, the 11 million, 22 million estate tax minimum, if that's only for California, they're in Ohio and they have to deal with their mom's estate in Pennsylvania. So no, that is 
federal estate taxes. That's United States estate taxes. Some states do have their own estate tax. California, for whatever reason, does not have an estate tax. It's the one thing California has decided not to tax us on yet. There is no California estate tax separate from the federal estate tax. Uh, I can only assume at some point in the future that will change because like I said, everything else we're taxed on here in California. So I, uh, I can assume in the future that will change. But as of right now, there is no estate tax for California. That 11 and 22 million, that is for United States federal estate taxes. Ben? No, sorry. Looks like that's all. The Mark also had a question. I don't know if he wanted to ask you a question in person. So, sure. Let me go ahead and hit him on mute. So, I know he had a question. Mark, yeah, are you I, there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I had a friend that uh, quit claimed uh, his deed, his house to me. Does it still need to be in a living trust or a will? If he dies, can I just take that notarized quick claim deed and then title the house in my name? So has it not, so he, he signed a notarized uh, quick claim deed to you, but did not record it. Is that correct? Correct. So, right. So it's an unrecorded deed at this point. So yes, um, that's less than ideal, but it typically will work, right? So the question is, you know, if there's another so if right so you have a deed that's been signed but not recorded right so if he Correct. were to sell the house now we have multiple deeds floating around as to what the actual who the actual owner of the house is right so that can prevent some that can provide some confusion right so that's the biggest concern that i would have the other the other concern is you know by signing the house over to you you are the true even though it hasn't been recorded, you're the true owner of it now, right? So you can do anything you want with it. And that should technically, and maybe we don't want to do this on a recorded webinar, but that technically should be a taxable event, the, the giving the property to you. Uh, taxable is in what the current rate of the, or the, the house is worth? Correct, correct. And that's an issue too that we, you know, we face all the time where, uh, where a parent says, I'll just put my adult child on the deed to the house as joint tenants, right? And so that is actually a taxable event that should trigger income taxes from that gift. Okay, all right. Um, but yeah, he's got a bank account too. He's living on money that was left to him through a, a good friend of his and um, he gets social security. So, I mean, he's not in, he's not gonna sell the house, he's living there. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, but I, so I, I do want to set him up with a will or a living trust. And so I think, you know, what he's doing is kind of what we talked about earlier, the, you know, what they call, you know, poor man's estate planning, right, or something like that, right, where it's, where it's, you try to do some things to try to protect you or your assets um, in a limited way. And so it, it can work, right? But there are potential wrinkles or issues there. Like I said, one of them being if you were to sell it was one. One of them is that it technically should be a taxable event right now because the transfer actually occurred already. Um, so, you know, the ways to avoid that is you can achieve the same result by putting it into a living trust and designating you as the beneficiary of that home when something happens to him. That's the ideal case, obviously it costs more money right now, right? You have to get the trust set up and actually do the work right now. But that is typically the, the more ideal way to handle it. And what's the uh, the cheapest living trust? Is that $1,500? So the, for, for with us, right? I can only speak to my own fees, right? But the 1500 is a, for a will-based plan. So our trust-based plans start at 3000. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Thank okay. you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I believe there's other questions, uh, Ben, in the chat as well. Uh, they were asking also, how did they get a list of lenders that would not invoke a do on sale issue after they die? So yeah, I mean, there's so many lenders out there. It's it's hard to keep track of who does or hey. who doesn't, right? So that's a question really when you're speaking to them of whether they'll, whether they will call it or not, right? So, you know, it's, if it's gonna be, 
rental property, if it's not your primary residence and you're going to have a mortgage on it, you know, ideally it's when you attain new property after the trust has been created, you just take it directly in the trust name and it's less of an issue. It's more of an issue for existing rental properties that you already have, you already have a mortgage on, and now we're creating the trust and we want to get it into the trust. That's when we have to ask their permission or refinance with a lender that isn't, that was willing to put it into the name of the trust or um, similar to what Mark was talking about, we can do other situations like that um, where we kind of do it more carefully so that they don't call the loan. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for all those questions that you answered for us. Uh, if there is any other questions that the attendees might have, uh, please feel free to contact Ben at any time. And like I said, you could also contact me directly and I'm more than happy to send those questions over to Ben so that we can answer it for you guys uh, directly. Uh, any, uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention to, to everybody today, I wanted to thank you again for joining us today for the educational seminar topic that we have today, which is state planning with Ben. Uh, next week, we are going to have another uh, educational seminar and is actually going to be with Chip and he will be uh, discussing the fundamentals of personal finance. So if you guys are interested in joining us for that educational seminar next week, you're more than welcome to go through our website uh, to be able to register directly and be able to RSVP for that event as well. Thanks to everybody that joined us today and have a wonderful evening and be safe out there. Thank you.